Greetings, Left Turn Addicts. Happy October 1st. You've probably woken Billy Joe Armstrong up telling him that September has ended, have gone to town some candy corn, and watched every Halloween and Friday the 13th film and or Nightmare on Elm Street film, including Frey vs. Jason. So a lot of blood being spilled. While there will be no decapitations and hot chicks waiting to be stabbed, or bitch one-liners for that matter, we are indeed going to talk about who I call the Hammerhead in Red. That's right, folks, the hero of your time and mine, Ralph Dale Earnhardt Jr., the Drift God of the Year. I'm Pete Draft Kid. Let's go. Dale Earnhardt Jr., the son of Dale Earnhardt and the grandson of Ralph Lee Earnhardt, had some big shoes to fill. His grandfather had over 350 wins under his belt in his 23 years of racing with four championships. Unfortunately, Ralph Lee Earnhardt died of a heart attack on September 26th of 1973. Junior was born just a year and a month after, October 10th, 1974. Which meant, of course, that he was not able to create fond memories with his legend of a driver grandfather, who was given names such as Mr. Consistency and Ironheart. While Earnhardt Sr. would become known as Ironhead, Junior would become known as Hammerhead. You can read all about it in his excellent Race to the Finish My Storybook. Now, Junior, like most growing boys, wanted to get closer to his dad. His father, Earnhardt Sr., by the end of his career, had 76 wins under his belt and 7 championships to tie with the King Richard Petty in 26 years of racing from 1975 to 2001, the year of which is 3 years prior. He would win the race that he's always wanted, the Daytona 500 in 1998. However, 3 years later in that same race, February 18th of 2001, he would tragically die after a terrible wreck colliding with Ken Schrader. So it sent his longtime rival, best friend, now color commentator Daryl Waltrip, in emotional days, hoping this would not be Dale's final checkered flag. His son Michael Waltrip, who raced under Senior's team, Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, of a bittersweet, somber victory. Now, growing up, Dale Senior lived under the roof of his dad, Ralph Lee Earnhardt, who was not only an excellent racer, but was also a blue collar cotton mill worker who had little to nothing and had to be exceptional and consistent in racing in order to put quality food on the table. This, of course, would fuel Senior to shape up Dale Jr., who was pretty much Dennis the Menace of the family. For Senior, there was no time for playing. Do everything I say and ask you to do, or you're going to get the bell. One story in particular would explain that when Junior was on the Bustin' Boys podcast. Think of it kind of like the part in Predator where Dutch would hide in the mud, only in this case it was a hay bale for six hours, managing to evade a severe intimidator ass-kicking because Junior could not keep his mouth clean. His mother Brenda would be out of the picture, with her and Senior's daughter Kelly Earnhardt being the one to take care of Junior, even going out of her way to transfer to Oak Ridge Military Academy in North Carolina just to look after him. How only Simpson of her? Hmm, I wonder how well she did in weaponry considering who her dad is, or Junior for that matter. Anyways, as many famous athletes, Senior wasn't really around for Junior. Trips were non-existent. No Kodak photos of the two Earnhardt men holding up their kill of the day and frying it up. Dale was pretty much a shadow until he started to get behind the wheel, just like his old man. And Junior, in the same vein of how Cody Rhodes and Dusty Rhodes were, for wrestling, he wanted to be a part of the sport in order to get closer to his dad. Earnhardt did love his son. It was very much a hard knocks, blue collar, pick up your bootstraps kind of love that he grew up with his father. Not much sensitivity for the man black. Less Mr. Rogers, more Hank Hill. Dale was pretty much always one to grin, laugh, or stare down. So to see him nearly in tears was a rarity. 1996 one two punch Brickyard 400 was one of the moments the man in black finally felt blue. A broken collarbone and sternum for the diehard 400 in Talladega that same year would catch up to him. At only six laps, the Intimidator could take no more, as Mike Skinner would take over for him. The tough as nails iron head would show Russ, as he would say, Dad gun was real hard to get out of that car, Jerry. It's my life right here. A man who loved racing to the very last bolt. We love you, Dale. We know your rattling cage is up in heaven. Three years later, 1999, the year of the future, Blink-182 were released on their smash hit albums with Travis Barker in Enema of the State. Oakley's and long trench coats thanks to The Matrix were the name of the game, and Lewinsky and Clinton engaging in coitus was the new hot-button topic in the White House. But all pale in comparison to one bleach blonde decided to tell everyone, Hi, when his name is not him, I'm talking about Dale Earnhardt Jr., who raced the Coca-Cola 600 May 30th, 1999. The troublemaking shadow turned blonde hammerhead in red had finally arrived. 
But with Dale Jr. not having nearly as much experience in Cup Series racing, he wasn't exactly sitting the world on fire just yet. Finishing in 16th place, while his father finished in 6th, once again failing to keep up with his dad and his high expectations. And get this, he was the first... DEI driver. Oh my gosh! Quick, everyone, burn all your merchandise. He is responsible for the destruction and inclusivity of NASCAR. I mean, what do you think this is? The land of opportunity and civil rights? Huh. So, now that I've since taken my meds, we can now talk about Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, a team of which Senior and his wife Teresa Earnhardt founded in 1998 creating numerous amounts of business partnerships and merchandise, including that, and I'm not kidding here, an Intimidator Speedboat, yes, that was the thing, yes, it's real. Not to mention having three of the best drivers in the sport, Steve Park, Dale Jr., and the brother of Jaws himself, Michael Waltrip. Yes, I know I called him his son. It's not my fault that he looks that young, especially at that time. Anyways, it seemed like everything would go perfectly. But after the loss of Dale, things took a turn for the worse. And even before that, in Junior's debut at Martinsville, no less, the cracks were already showing with the up-and-comer Steve Park, where he went from taking the lead and passing Dale to spinning out after a slight accidental tap with Mayfield, and pretty much like Daryl Waltrip, he was out of the race. Radiator leakage and all. And obviously, as bad as that is, with not being able to finish the race, even with being in the lead and passing Dale Earnhardt, The worst was yet to come for old Steve Park. Two years later in Darlington, he would collide alongside Larry Foyt in the middle of a, excuse me, in the middle of a caution, no less. And while Steve Park was never the same again, and still hasn't been the same to this very day. And well, Pocono in 2002 didn't really help matters either, as he would crash right alongside Dale Earnhardt Jr., who luckily wasn't hurt and would end up hauling ass immediately just to make sure he was okay and well considering what we know about concussions now even with steve park being able to say he was fine he wasn't now remember how i said junior wasn't exactly sending will on fire just yet in 1999 well it didn't take too long two years in fact for old dj to not only compete but win the pepsi 400 in daytona that year where his father tragically passed in february needless to say British Spears did indeed give us a sign that it would be Dale Jr.'s time. I know that sucked. Moving on. Leaning 116 laps and just right behind his DI partner and Michael Waltrip. And between the years of 2004 and 2014, Jr. was a two time Daytona 500 winner. A race his father lived and died for. Jr. was the butt guy. And much like Duffman, if he had a Carolina twang and a goatee, Dale was all about having a good time. The man had a full-blown bar set up in his house as shown on MTV Cribs. Not understanding that while Budweiser advertised about taking a load off and having a good time, as a driver, you have standards to uphold, deadlines to meet. You're not just goofing off with your friends with no job besides going to school and or going to the shop. Junior was a grown man, but even 20-something-year-olds have teen-like minds. Kelly, as loving, caring, gorgeous, ow! Sorry, I had to do that in order to control myself from talking about her, as I do have a crush on her, but I'm here to keep professional. Moving on, there's the proof in the 27 guy with a team my pudding. Anywho, Kelly stood by Hammerhead DJ through and through, even though he was anything but a good businessman. With Kelly working at DEI, Junior never even thought to give her a raise, and for what Ty Norris said, who was part of DEI at the time, Junior himself didn't really get paid at all either. I'm aware that I haven't talked that much about Teresa outside of talking about uh, her and Dale Earnhardt Sr. being a part of DI and the creation of it. And Junior would, of course, say that when it comes to Teresa, there's a very hot and cold relationship with him and those DI and, or, of course, the fans for that matter. But it's beautiful to see how far Junior has come as a man. Even as much as Junior himself has had problems with her. He's not someone who will judge someone who looks at her in a positive manner. And despite his numerous concussions and visits to Pennsylvania to work out and help himself function better, he's still happily married to Amy Earnhardt, a father of two daughters and Isla and Nicole Earnhardt, 
and just recently finished seventh on September 20th at Bristol. The race where he would say, and I quote, Man, this is one of the greatest moments of my career. Why is that? It's Bristol, baby! I know that I could go more in depth about Dale Jr. and maybe I'll even go into his later career in the future. But all I can say is that he has been responsible for my fandom. I could have picked any other family or any other driver. I could have picked the Petties. I could have picked the Labonis. Or even the Foyts for that matter, which I don't have the picture of. But I chose the freaking Earnhardts. And I never look back and I never ever will. When I see myself in any driver, it's always going to be the one and only Ralph Dale Earnhardt Jr. in that gorgeous ruby red Chevrolet Monte Carlo. I thank all you left turn addicts for joining me on this exciting journey of one of my favorite drivers of all time. This is only the beginning, so strap in folks because we got plenty more laps to go till this race is over. We are closer to the year of 2025. Be sure to like, comment, and follow. And until then, folks, I'm Pete the Draft Kid, spinning out.